China has recently surpassed the United States as the largest feature film market in terms of box office in the first quarter of this year. The expansion of the media and entertainment market is fueling significant growth in cross-border collaboration and investment. Recognizing the expanding appetite among Chinese consumers for a premium entertainment experience, U.S. companies are actively seeking a local presence and exploring strategies to take advantage of the growing potential. At the same time, Chinese companies continue to demonstrate ambition and interest in investing opportunities that provide global exposure and impact in the United States. Both markets are benefiting from strengthened linkage through increased collaborations in creative development, technological innovation, and also cultural exchange. I'm honored to introduce to you our distinguished speakers, which include two Anderson alumni. So firstly, Craig Demmel, class of um, 1998, Executive Vice President, International Distribution of 20th Century Fox Film Entertainment. Craig. Wait. And also John Neerman. John Neerman, class of 1995, an advisory board member of the Center for Global Management. Mr. Neerman is also Chief Executive Officers and Founders of Far West Entertainment and former President of Electronic Art Asia. John. We also have Ellen Eliasrop, President and CEO of Village Roadshow Picture Asia, and Peter Shell, Founder and CEO of Or Media Group. <laughs> this panel will be moderated by Stephen Salzman. Mr. Salzman is a partner at Lobel LLP, a multi-service law firm whose entertainment and media practice is among the largest broad experience, um, the most comprehensive in the world. Mr. Salzman has broad experience in domestic and international transactions in the entertainment industry. He concentrates his practice on innovative and complex international co-productions and co-financing transactions, as well as on the representation of financiers, distributors, and producers, and talents in sophisticated motion picture and television transactions. His extensive experience encompasses the legal and business aspect across the value chain and a various segment of the industry. Without further delay, please welcome our moderator and panelist. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm obviously very pleased to be here on uh, moderating this panel with some of the most very accomplished uh, film, multimedia, and television executives working in that cross-section between Asia and, more specifically, Greater China and the United States. Um, their bios uh, and the details of their bios can all be found in the written materials that you have, so I'm not going to get into that. But I will point out perhaps just a few highlights from each of their backgrounds. First, Ellen Eliasoff to my left has some very interesting distinctions. First of all, being fluent in both Mandarin and Japanese. And she first came to China in 1979 as part of the initial group of American students to study in China following the normalization of US-China diplomatic relations. Later on, she also had a first, which was the first Hollywood executive to be based in China when she established Warner Brothers Beijing office in 1993. Um, and I'll have Ellen speak in a moment. Peter also has some very interesting distinctions in his resume. He was involved in the very first co-production with China, Restless, which I believe got a recent re-release, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he is a founder of the US-China Film Summit under the auspices of the Asia Society. He's the chairman of Orb Media, which is a feature film production company, but also a transmedia company. And he has served as the Hollywood-based brand builder for the Shaolin Temple. Craig Demmel has a very big job for Fox. Um, he's in charge of the theatrical release and planning and execution of the theatrical releases for all of 20th Century Fox's films, titles that are distributed in 60 markets. And I think one of the things, one of the kudos for him in the past few years is under his administration and under his leadership, Fox broke the industry record for box office, international box office, in a calendar year by over $500 million, earning an unprecedented $3.7 billion in 2014. So, pretty nice achievement. I had a little help. All right, and, and for one of your homegrown, one of your homegrown alums. And John should actually be moderating this panel, not me, because John has actually won awards for being a talk show host in Asia. And after presidential positions with both of Disney 
and with electronic arts, uh, working in Asia for both of these companies. He ultimately founded his own venture, Far West Entertainment, which is, again, everybody these days talks about transmedia, but some are really doing it. Uh, a multi-platform uh, company involved with television, music, live, live, uh, live productions, animation, and as I said before, the very first production was a talk show called Uncut, which John hosted, and it was nominated for Best Talk Show and Best Entertainment Host in its first two seasons at the Asian Television Awards. So congratulations to John for that. Uh, I thought we'd start with Ellen, who had some very interesting statistics that she thought she would share with the audience. Yeah, um, hello everybody. I'm going to present two non-slides right here. Um, I, I love these slides, I've developed them over time because I think they really reflect, kind of encapsulate where the Chinese film industry uh, has come to from where it started. And when I say started, obviously China has a great legacy of filmmaking going back to, you know, the early 20th century in Shanghai with Shaw Brothers and later on Golden Harvest and Raymond Chow and Bruce Lee and all of that stuff. The um, contemporary, what I would call commercialized Chinese film industry, probably you could say, and this is not to, um, not to say that Hollywood is so important or great, but it is to say that the 1993 importation of The Fugitive um, as the first revenue-sharing movie in China for the Chinese audience was triggered a turn in the Chinese film industry from a state-controlled, state-dominated uh, industry in which the state was the main consumer of films to a consumer-dominated industry in which the audience is the consumer of films, the main client or customer. The statistics are like this. Uh, in 1993, the total annual box office in renminbi terms in China was 2.8 billion renminbi. And at that time, that was probably about 600 or maybe 700,000 US dollars because the exchange rate was, was much different then. In uh, 2014, last year, the annual Chinese box office was 30 billion renminbi, which was almost 5 billion US dollars, uh, given exchange rate fluctuations, et cetera. It's projected that in 2017, the total annual box office in China will exceed that of the North American box office. So that's over 10 billion US dollars. Um, number of screens in China was 300. Why do I know that? because when we imported The Fugitive, they told us they would guarantee that it would be released on all 300 screens. The number of screens in China as of the end of 2014 was 23,000. It's now probably about 30-something thousand because there are 15 new screens opening every day. The average ticket price in China was five renminbi in 1993. It is now uh, 32 renminbi. The number of import, import films was zero before The Fugitive came in. Now the number of import films on a revenue sharing basis is 34 a year, plus an additional 30 or so a year that come in on a flat sale basis. There was one Hollywood studio operating in China, which was Warner Brothers. Now all the Hollywood majors and mini majors operate in China. And the private sector Chinese film companies in China in 1993 were none. And now there are dozens. So that's the really interesting story of a transformation of the industry, but I just want to um, put a little pause on that because I want to read to you from two headlines in The Hollywood Reporter from December 1st, 2014 and December 2nd, 2014. The first headline was, China Wanda in deal talks with Lionsgate MGM, chairman says. Many people come knocking at my door, but Wanda is only interested in the big players and we want control, says Wang Jianlin, chairman of China's Wanda Group, which bought AMC Entertainment in 2013 or 2012? Something. 2012. Very big deal. It's the biggest single deal that's been done so far uh, between the Chinese entertainment industry and the U.S. entertainment industry. But the next day, the headline in The Hollywood Reporter was, China to send filmmakers to countryside for ideological training. In a Mao Zedong-style move, authorities tell China's media elite it should learn from the peasantry. 
in the latest in what is being seen as a crackdown on cultural affairs in the country, China's media watchdog wants to send filmmakers and TV producers to the countryside, quote, to do field study and experience life. So that is the balancing that goes on endlessly in the Chinese film industry, and it affects every aspect of the industry, as our other speakers will attest to. Peter? How do you match that? <laughs> <laughs> Can you lead me? What's the, what's the question? Yeah, give a question. I think, Peter, uh, the question is, you've been pioneering in this area as well for a long time. You started out with Restless many years ago. Uh, then you founded a company called Iron Pond, which was at its inception to be both a financing entity, sort of a private equity fund, as well as a production company. And you, you've witnessed and participated in these changes, this evolution that Ellen was talking about. So looking both retrospectively and prospectively, we've seen these changes. What do you see your role in, in, in these changes? In other words, what role have you played and what role do you anticipate playing? Well, I think, you know, I remember meeting Ellen, I think, many, many years ago. This is probably 1995 when this was absolutely the most unsexy thing to do. <laughs> it's not, you wouldn't pack halls. In fact, you couldn't put five people together who wanted to talk about this except from, uh, from a very artistic point of view. Now, it, you know, eight, fast forward 15, 16 years, in my view, this has become the hottest place to be. In certain respects, I, I consider all the formative years to be the training ground because the thing hasn't really started. It's only starting to peak. So, um, I, so that's how I really see the past. It's really been building up a framework and understanding. I was having lunch with another friend just talking about this. I think there's kind of three elements here. One is knowing how to operate in Hollywood, which is its own piece of machinery. You have to kind of know how this town runs then you have to have enough expertise on the China side. How does the China system work? How is it different? And then there's, there's a science of how do you kind of merge these, three, these two elements together. So I think this is at a very, very exciting point. Some of those numbers certainly tell that story. I think there's new players now. Um, we don't talk enough about how big online games are really transforming the, 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 the global landscape. And when you look at it pound for pound, Mobile games in China is actually even big, bigger than the motion picture business, right. let alone you know, browser-driven games. Oh, so not enough attention is really spoken to those. And, and then you think about the rise of the BATs of the world, or I think um, Wanda would like it to be BWAT. <laughs> so these mega players that are worth uh, hundreds of billions of dollars, that have tremendous reach, that have huge databases, that have usual en user engagement, now they're going into this space in a very, very forthright way. So um, other than looking at China and in terms of its enormous performance, I ask what's next. So um, I think what's next is that China is going to become a very innovative player with global dimensions. Um, that you're going to see, because they're not really bound by any kind of uh, business models of the past. They're not bound by windows. They're not bound by how business used to be done. So they are here today with the post 80s and 90s also known as the millennials, who are um, digital omnivores. They consume content on various platforms. So I think those kind of buying behaviors, which is the mainstream of China, is already changing the landscape. And these practices will be pushed out to the world. So the, 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 the role that I see as an entrepreneur is to really build a company and a platform that can really harness these market realities today. And coming from the Hollywood side is, can, can you create a, an enterprise that is um, connected to China in a meaningful way. The Chinese word would be jie di qi, to be connected to the, you know, the Chinese earth energy elements. <laughs> earth energy. So Craig, with all of the numbers and statistics that Ellen is talking about, that's obviously had a huge impact on any major studios, in particular yours, orientation towards this marketplace. I mean, literally, back in 1993, you could more or less honestly ignore it because it wasn't really a worthwhile endeavor. Fast forward to where we are today, a completely different story. So how has that changed you know, your uh, business practices? How has that changed what a major studio is doing to react to this explosive growth? Well, um, you know, we still, one of the things about China is that given 
given the fact that we don't know whether our films are going to get in, they only take you know 34 films, and so you you basically are hoping to get uh, you know assortment of films in your slate into the market. We d we don't put into our plan numbers for movies the, the the China numbers. That that was up until recently. Now, in order to keep the growth, you you have to start putting China China into your into your numbers. So, so to make films like X-Men Days of Future Past or, or the next uh, Independence Day sequel, yes, it's coming. Um, you gotta, you got to put that into the, you gotta put that into the plan. You can't be making 200, 300 million dollar films unless you're assuming to get 100 million dollars out of China. So that's, that's, a big, that's a big change that is literally just happening now. I mean, despite the fact that, that since Avatar, there are now every year multiple films, multiple U.S. films, and obviously multiple Chinese films that are making over 100 million U.S. dollars in the, in the market every year. Um, we still look at that as, it's almost like winning the lottery. It's like, yes, we got into China, and suddenly we're going to get extra box office in China. But, but now we, we can no longer look at it that way. We have to assume that our biggest films are going to get in, and, um, and then we also have to, to create them so that they will get in, because obviously there are some hurdles as well, but we can talk about those things later. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable now. I mean, really, the, most of the world, with the exception of Southeast Asia and Latin America, and, and I'll put Latin America and the Middle East on a much smaller scale, um, Southeast Asia is really, truly driving the growth in the movie business right now. And, because it's, I mean, China, obviously, on the biggest level, but really places like Malaysia, Indonesia, um, even Korea is still growing in a, in a huge way. I realize that's not Southeast Asia, but but still, we're, we're still seeing incredible growth in the region just in general. Um, and then also, Asia in general overtook the US, or sorry, North America and Europe this year to become the biggest region uh, in the world in, in, in terms of box office. So it's, it's really where we do have to focus our, our efforts. Um, and given the fact that you've got mature market, I mean, the US obviously is a mature market, as is most of Western Europe, Australia, um, those are places that we relied upon before to, to make our, our money. Um, and now, obviously, those markets are all sort of flat, if not declining. Um, we're sort of, as we're losing home entertainment revenue and as the TV deals are sort of changing in, in some, of the, some of the Western markets, we, we really do have to, to rely on, on places like China and, and the rest of Southeast Asia to, to really drive our business going forward. So. And John, you know, as... as basically relatively new to the entrepreneurial side after working for large companies, um, you're trying to work both angles. You're trying to work the content that is connecting to Asia and being distributed and exploited in Asia and greater China, but you're also trying to work angles of Asia-created content or Asia-created acts streaming over to the other side, to the global marketplace. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. We're, uh, we're working every angle we can uh, just to try to somehow tie it all together. Um, yeah, I'd spent 20 some years in the corporate world with, first I was a Disney guy, then I became the video game guy, then I became the talk show guy, <laughs> and then the girl band guy, which is a, <laughs> It's a whole different story and went really way off on a curve What kind of guy that. are you now? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I just, I get invited along, kind of like <laughs> the cousin they feel sorry for. Uh, but yeah, we, we see that there's a great opportunity. I, I first moved to Asia in 98. Uh, typical expat assignment, two to three years, it turned into 15. Living on the ground, most of it in Hong Kong, Shanghai. Uh, had a little detour to Tokyo and Singapore. But during that time, really discovered there's a tremendous amount of talent. There's great entertainment. And obviously, you've got your hubs of entertainment with Bollywood and K-pop and M-pop, and everyone has their own thing going on. But it really hadn't crossed over in a global way. And that's what we wanted to do. That's where we saw the opportunity with Far West, bridging the Far East with the West, was somehow becoming that back and forth bridge. Uh, if you look at... I don't know, Emmys, Oscars, Grammy. Look for Asian names back in 2000 on any of those lists. I don't think you're going to find very many. 2010, still not a whole lot. But I think that'll change. I think 2015, 2020, you're going to get more and more as since Asia, China, let's talk about China, they become a global political superpower than an economic power. But entertainment-wise, that's where we feel the opportunity is, just for that crossover. So yes, definitely it's all about reciprocity. 
not only going there and trying to push your products, but really trying to help create that bridge for them for the rest of the world. Makes sense. I'm going to start with Craig, but I'd like anybody to chime in. What I tend to see a lot, and you kind of lightly touched on it, is this notion of optimization of product for the Chinese marketplace. I mean, I think we've seen this in some of your competitors' uh, programming, you know, transformers. Yeah, yeah. So leaving aside for a moment official co-productions, but just this notion of optimization for the Chinese marketplace, both to be able to get in and derive revenue. What's your view on that and, and the challenges, the successes, maybe some of the pitfalls? Okay, that's a, yeah, that's a good one. There's a lot, lot there. Um, well, I mean, you know, obviously we, you know, we, we had uh, Fan Bingbing in, in X-Men, so that's like, you know, but that's really just, that's really just like throwing a token person into the movie to maybe say, hey, look, see, we, we're, we're, we're friendly to China here. So, so it's not, you know, that's, that's just sort of the, the very, the, the the basic we can do, I mean, we do that all the time. We'll throw a Brazilian, you know, Fast and Furious is perfect at this. It's a perfect example of a multicultural, multidimensional movie. But we'll throw in actors from different countries that we really want to sort of break through in. And, uh, and obviously, so now it's, it's, back in the day, it was, it was uh, what was it, Ken Watanabe was in every single Hollywood film where he wanted to make money in Japan. You know, that was, the, right. that was it. But now, now you're going to see, obviously, more and more uh, Chinese actors and actresses in in Hollywood films, and then the reverse is now true. Obviously, with you see Hollywood actors uh, showing up in Chinese films, and a, a reporter asked me about that the other day, and I said, "Well, why wouldn't you? Because you, you know, if you if you suddenly are successful, you know, a Hollywood actor that's successful in Chinese films can can obviously ask a lot more money from a from a Hollywood producer and a Hollywood uh, studio." Knowing that, oh, that guy's popular in China, that's going to be worth an extra, however millions, many millions of dollars. Um, but to your point, there are, there are pluses and minuses. Like, for instance, we've got a film coming up called uh, The Martian, which is based on a book. Ridley Scott is directing it. And part, basically, it's, it's about a guy who gets stranded on Mars. And so the entire world literally comes together to try and save this guy to bring him back because they, they have to leave without him. Well, one of the plot points is that the Chinese have a rocket that it's the only rocket that's sort of ready to go out in space when you need it to go out in space. And so, and so then the U.S. has to negotiate with the Chinese to get this rocket in space. So if done well, we obviously make the Chinese look great in that movie, and, right. and, and, then, and then suddenly we have a good movie. If done incorrectly, if it becomes sort of this political thing, then suddenly the Chinese Censorship Bureau will say, yeah, that's a little sensitive, and maybe we're not going to let that go in. So, you know, and, we, and we've been on both sides of that as far as on the positive side and the negative side, we've had some films not get in for, for reasons that are, you know, sometimes a little confusing. I'd say to, to Western consumers, but but the government has very strict strict rules on what they're what they're okay with and what they're not okay with. Um, so you have to be you have to be kind of careful. You know, I remember a couple of years ago with Iron Man, they they wanted to make it a co-production, right. and right as it was about to release, they they kind of changed the rules of of what it meant to be a co-production. Um, so it's it's an interesting uh, it's it's a very interesting uh, landscape and it's an ever changing one. So you have, you do have to be cautious, I think. But but uh, but but I think in general, though, I think we're um, I think we're finding that it's that it's they're open to 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 most to most movies as long as it's just not too terribly controversial and so forth. So. Alan, do you have any thoughts on that in terms of is it even now infecting not only casting decisions, but who you may work with as a director, development decisions, early stage development in terms of the projects you're looking for or how those projects may be shaped? Well, I'm actually running the side of our business that makes Chinese movies. So yes, everything in how we develop, how we cast, who directs, you know, uh, even how we, who we partner with uh, in China is done with a view to making sure that our movies work for China because China is the initial release market for any Chinese movie and for any co-production. Uh, even a co-production between, say, a U.S. company and a Chinese company uh, has to be released first in China. It can be released simultaneously outside of China, but it can't be released prior outside of China. So. The, you know, in China, because there are no revenue streams apart from box office, because there's not a developed, you know, online uh, pay-per-view, television, uh, you know, cable, whatever, subscription, that is not developed in China. 
So basically, everything that you're going to make from a Chinese movie and everything that you're going to make from releasing your import movies into China, except for a very small sale to television, mm -hmm. is determined by how it goes at the box office with the Chinese audience. So, I mean, I don't have anything different to say about Hollywood movies, except for the fact that I think that a really good Hollywood movie is going to do well in China, irrespective of whether there is any Chinese character in Great. it or Chinese Great. setting, because China, the Chinese audience is very sophisticated. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They love good movies. They love entertaining movies. And they discount the Chinese stuff that's put in there because they feel it's kind of arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah. So if I were in your shoes, I wouldn't worry that much. I'd just yeah. keep yeah. making good movies. But from our point of view on the China side, everything has to cater to what the Chinese audience wants right then at that time. Got it. Um, switching gears for a moment, we've watched a lot of capital at least starting to come into the U.S. marketplace in terms of deal making, actual deals being concluded. Uh, we saw the Studio 8 deal, Jeff Robinoff's studio. We've seen the recent deal announced between uh, Huawei and STX, which already had a Chinese fund involved in the inception of that company, uh, the Yunnan TV deal with Lionsgate. So we've seen the beginnings of some serious capital coming into the U.S. marketplace. Um, Peter, what do you see as, first of all, the motivations for this capital coming in? And what do you see as the challenges, the big challenges to those deals closing and coming to fruition? Well, we've got two, one that's closed for sure, which is, which is the Hunan Lionsgate deal. Right. Um, but if you look at um, two of them, the Hunan deal and the STX deal, they're actually very similar. It's the Chinese investing in a slate of foreign product, which they can import into China okay. and drop into their own distribution channels. So. I think it's, it's really the tip of the iceberg, and having spoken to some of the guys involved, I think everybody agrees that the future is really, what, is the, what are going to be the synergies between these two parties? So the question is, what's next? Now that there's plenty of capital exchanging hands, essentially to buy into Hollywood movies, is that fundamentally, how is that going to evolve next? I know it's the intention of um, Lionsgate and Hunan, or STX and, and Huayi Brothers, and certainly for, for, um, for Studio 8 to ultimately co-produce, to result in product that I think is the holy grail of this entire business. Can, can you create global movies with Chinese elements that will qualify as a local Chinese movie, thereby getting 43% of the box office versus the 25% if you're lucky to get on a revenue sharing basis? So that getting that 43 and holding on to the world is the holy grail of it all. And the race is on. So my view is that the big deals are getting done, but now uh, the harder, more difficult thing is upon us, which is how are you going to synergize? Will the filmmakers be, act, be able to create con product that is born out of this kind of union? And frankly, that's where, that's the most exciting part to be. And that's the, that's the part that um, storytellers and entrepreneurs and other folks are really, really trying to crack and certainly something that I, I, I lose sleep over. <laughs> Peter mentioned something that I'd like for you to expand upon, John, a little bit, which is leaving feature film aside, because as Peter pointed out, these are all feature film deals. These are about being able to invest in product which can be brought back into the Chinese marketplace. What about other areas of the media industry? For example, gaming. Do you have different challenges in gaming? Do you have different challenges in the other aspects of, of entertainment that you're working in? I think, you know, gaming's a great example of what China did really, really well. And they kind of did it quietly because, you know, film gets all the print. It's like, ooh, we can only do this number <laughs> per year. And all the big studios are right there. So they're kind of behind the scenes going, all right, so Korea has this established online game market, mid, early, mid-2000s. China really starts going after it in a very legitimate way. No, this isn't about, there's no piracy discussion. There's none of that kind of throwing it off. They're building up a legitimate online game business. It took four years to surpass Korea. I mean, they really went hard <laughs> to get past that four billion. And not only that, but they really put a lot of money into their own development. So 
where I think there was an opportunity for us initially in that 04, 2005 area to use some of EA's licenses or IP, quickly we were becoming irrelevant because they were building their own fast, a lot faster than we could. But yet global brands will always do well. FIFA, a game that uh, EA has the rights for, was a great game and does well online. But I think, and again, keep in mind, video games, a huge opening for a video game is not $100 million, it's a billion dollars. When Halo or something, or Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, those are billion dollar weekends. So this industry is a crazy industry. So I think that they were very smart, China, in the way that they approached the online game market, and that goes across, across all platforms now. Yeah. You're talking about the, on your phone and the, the penetration of phones over there. Forget about it. You know, it's yeah. great. So I think there are many others. What we focus on, music, television, Music's a tough business, man, but you know, there's still, there's opportunity, but nothing like games or even TV. And sort of segueing from that, which is something that Ellen and I were talking about just before we got on the stage, and I'll put you on the spot, Craig, because you weren't part of that conversation. <laughs> um, China is obviously on the forefront of what I would call social platform marketing and really using social media as a means of marketing and gaining consumer acceptance of the product early on. Is that you know, a game changer in terms of what you're doing at Fox and for the big distributors? Yeah, well, well absolutely. I mean, pretty much, uh, again, we, we don't have really control of our films. We hand them off and then they, they get distributed by the, the China Film, which is a state-run uh, distributor. Um, and that's how the majors operate. Obviously, the independents can can go different routes, and that's what's happening now, which is which is really interesting. But um, so there's not a lot of money spent on on uh, movie marketing, and really the way your movies get found is is through through Weibo and through the through the social networks. It's 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 remarkable actually, and in fact it's it's almost one of those things. I would love to be able to replicate this in other markets where we're spending millions of dollars on TV, which is mostly wasted because you're mostly spending you know 80% of the people watching your TV ad are not interested in your movie anyway. Obviously, we know that from the U.S. and from Western Europe and so forth. So it'd be great if we could if we could develop this better, if we could if we could harness this better. It just it's because I guess the uh, the Chinese consumers have become accustomed to um, be, to finding out about their movies through social media. That is where they go to find out. And so the so the the plus side is that is that obviously if you start getting really talked about in social media, you can really have a hit on your hands. The negative side, if your movie's not that good, they're going to find out about that really quickly, yeah. and it's not gonna it's not gonna make it. But I mean, a good example is Life of Pi a couple years ago, where the the powers that be. Uh, that film was selected as the last revenue share film of the year, and it was selected over Skyfall and The Hobbit. And the reason was because at that time, the U.S. films were, were, uh, had a higher than 50% of the market, and local films had a lower than 50%. And so they thought, okay, let's just let this little, this little film about an Indian boy come into the market, and nobody's <laughs> nobody going to really care. Right. And $90 million later, you know, right. and, and it became a huge, yeah. huge deal, and... and um, you know, and, and so it's re it was really fascinating to see that see that happen. And plus, in the, in the meantime, it, there was this whole IMAX fervor about it and everything. So it just it just the, the stories are so fascinating, and, and how and how all of this plays out really in social media. So now again, we got to be really careful because, like we were talking about with with that, with throwing a Chinese star into your movie, you know, you you can't try and pretend to make up your own your own social noise. It's really yeah. got to happen organically, and, and right. obviously that's, that's really that's tricky, right. but. But there are some really good uh, agencies, social media agencies uh, in China that obviously we utilize to, uh, to try and uh, get our films out there and get them, get them sort, of, sort of more popular and, and really, really get them to succeed. Um, so I've been given a little bit of a, a time warning and I would love to learn more from John about his experiences creating the, the girl band and from Peter about particular mm -hmm. projects he's working on. But I'll throw something out to the group with some of the limited time we have, because I think there may be a difference of opinion. A Chinese giant media company buying a US studio in the near future, far future. What are your thoughts? And we can sort of work from John, to, from you to, to Ellen. Pure speculation, three experts, not an expert, but I uh, definitely see it happening. I, I'd say 
I, I'm not obviously right now, but five to ten years. Okay. Yeah. Um, until a conversation I had a little while ago, I would have said even sooner than that, but, but I know one of us disagrees. But I, I think it's, um, look, we, we, of the two studios that, that and again, I, please don't quote me on this in The Hollywood Reporter, but the two studios that, are, that would be sort of potential takeovers would be Sony and Paramount. Um, and Sony in particular was one that has been talked about a lot, which would be funny changing from Japanese hands to Chinese hands. Um, but, but it's, I think, look, I, I think it's probably something that's going to happen. I, I do. I do. Yeah. Uh, clearly, when you look at it from a macro point of view, certainly there's enough capital to do the transaction. The question is why? Why, why would they want to do that and what, for what purpose? So I have a hard time coming up with that, except maybe a sense of cultural pride or the, the you know, extending China's soft power reach into the world so they can buy it. I, you know, I think they have to come up with a really good reason on why they should do it. Uh, I think there may be, other than the, the usual round of suspects in terms of um, who those companies are, and I think we had this discussion earlier, you know, whether it's a Wanda or Alibaba, Tencent definitely has a capital to do it. But there could be a whole capital play. I think it's also very likely that there may just be Chinese capital involved, not related to an existing operating company, to do something like it. I think what's more likely to happen is that there's going to be a lot more uh, smaller transactions in the M&A space. We're already seeing it happen. Most of the Chinese uh, publicly traded companies are buying EBITDA like crazy around the world because the multiples they're getting in that marketplace is just, you know, they're getting 20 to 50%. 20 to 50 times versus you know the 5 to 10 that you get off a Nasdaq company. So those kind of transactions are going to continue, and we'll be probably seeing you know 5 to 10 of those a year. Really quickly before we go down, is that a bubble? Is that of course it's a bubble. Okay. <laughs> but the Chinese real estate bubble can last for decades. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Ellen, I know you have a strong opinion. Uh, well, I'm, I'm modulating my opinion so that I can, you know, it doesn't seem crazy. Um, I think, first of all, I think all of these deals where Chinese companies are buying into slates of Hollywood movies or are just commissioning, essentially, which is what Hua Yi is doing, commissioning a slate of Hollywood movies uh, from a producer in Hollywood that they can distribute on their platforms in China, and that's just not theatrical, it's... It's online, it's, you know, pay-per-view, it's all of these, like Tencent, Baidu, they all have the need for lots and lots of content that can be released in China. That's a really good way for them to learn about how the business works in Hollywood. But if they really learn how the business works in Hollywood, they may conclude that it is such a fragile and unpredictable uh, organism that they probably shouldn't buy one. And there's two reasons. First of all, um, it's very sensitive uh, what kind of content you're associated with uh, globally comes back to bite you in China if it's content that is in any way uh, antithetical to what is approvable in the Chinese marketplace for consumers to see. So yes, if they were going to buy a Hollywood studio, they, certainly they have the money, as Peter said, they would have to control the content creation process completely. But if they were to do that, they would destroy the studio. So I think that the smarter they get, the more reluctant they will to be to have their business come back to them in China in that way, because they can achieve their goals by buying product that fits what they need, rather than having to buy the whole Megillah and run into crazy directors, writers, producers, you know, who do unpredictable things. So before, maybe what we'll do, we have five minutes left, open it up to a quick <coughs> Q&A session. Um, we have somebody here in the front with a microphone. So if there are any questions from the audience, we can open it up real quick for a few. Um. A quick question. Uh, in U.S., we have seen many technology companies are getting into the content creation business, like Amazon, Hulu, and Netflix. So have you seen a similar trend happening in China? So. All. <laughs> Alibaba. 
Alibaba just uh, bought a film company and set up its own film division. And Tencent and Aichi and Baidu are all getting into the content creation business. I think the short answer is every single one of them in more advanced ways than you can imagine. So not just a little bit, not just a toe in the water, but we're talking about short form content, we're talking about long form content, we're talking about television content. It's just the whole gamut of things. Maybe we could speak a little bit very quickly though to regulation in those areas because we obviously do have relatively new regulations I think that just went into, uh, into effect frankly, dealing with the online world. So, Craig, maybe you could speak to that? Actually, or? probably not the online world, okay. I can't, but yeah. Hey, yeah. John? I, I think they went in effect, what, April 1? Yeah. yeah. So, it's, you've, it's still unknown, largely unknown. Where we deal in the TV and online space has always been kind of gray uh, when it comes to branded content and, branded and programming, but we are speaking to all the aforementioned players, because all we do is really create content. So, it's all about original content as opposed to distribution. Uh, but we're finding along the way what all these regulations mean, but so many things got pulled off online. You have to kind of go through the clearinghouse now, which is really still largely being defined, I feel. So it's very gray right now. But that doesn't affect the creation of domestic content by Chinese companies. No, no, right? you're right. Only it's for imported import, 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 yeah, content. It's for, for the import. So have there been... Have there been instances thus far where a U.S. studio would create a film and do an alternate cut or an alternate ending for submission to the Chinese market? And would that be allowed um, to, submit, to then have two different versions of the film? Well, yes. In fact, it happens all the time. Um, in fact, we, you, the film Kingsman Secret Service, which we, which we released here in February and released about two weeks ago in China, we cut out the, if anybody's seen it, we cut out the church scene. Um, and that's just because in China there's actually no, uh, there's no official censorship. So you kind of, everything has to sort of fall in that PG range. And obviously there are extremes to that of, on, on both sides. Um, but, but yeah, that, that basically we, we sort of self-censor. We, we sort of know what's okay. And we, we tend to try and we'll either show it to a consultant ahead of time and have them tell us what we think we should, we should cut out of it in order to get it through. Um, or we'll do it ourselves and then submit a version we think will be, will be acceptable. Um, and that's how you get an R-rated film here in the U.S. that would be, you cut it down to like a PG and, it, and you could get it in. And can I just say there are also examples of music lyrics changing for songs mm -hmm. when they go yeah. over there. Uh, video games, obviously we're talking about how no ghost skeletons, you know, things, things like that specific to different industries. <coughs> Yep. Yep. Um, I'm really curious to know. I think this is maybe specifically for Craig and Ellen, but you might want to mention about. Uh, if you had any, you mentioned Life of Pi already, but any other big surprises, either positive or negative, in movies that you released, and um, what you learned from that experience? Hmm. Um, that's a tricky. It's a tricky one. I mean. Uh, because that was probably one of the one of the bigger surprises. Um, you know, more recently, it's been fairly predictable. I mean, you know, you're, you're kind of expecting if you have a superhero, big superhero film, it's going to make about a hundred million bucks. Um, uh, it's it's pretty much where it goes. You know, the trans Transformers. You know, they obviously they do so much money, and the irony of that is that when we're talking about you know blatant product placement in a movie, that one that one had it in spades, and actually they, they talked all about it in social media, but it didn't stop anybody from going. Um, uh, you know, I, I can't really think of anything that surprised me in a negative way, and uh, necessarily, um, and maybe, maybe I can um, think of one actually. Um, two, I can think of two. Uh, Gravity was a huge hit in China, and um, it was actually um, almost not accepted right, for right. release by the China Film Group <laughs> because they thought, why would somebody want to see a movie that was um, just a few characters kind of, you know, talking in the middle of nothingness and, they w you know what I mean? <laughs> and yes. so there was a question whether it would be released, but then it opened in the States and it did incredible business. And then the Chinese government decided to import it and lo and behold, it was the perfect movie for China because they love 
big 3D IMAX movies. It had just an amazing, you know, thrill ride of an experience. It was really fast paced. It didn't matter that there were only two actors. I mean, and both of the actors were great. And the unintended product placement, because when they wrote the script for Gravity, they never thought about five, six years later, because that's how long it took to develop it and get it released, that the Chinese audience would think it was really cool that a Chinese spaceship was the only one that was still orbiting that Sandra Bullock could, you know, hit to ride on. And so that was a big, big hit, and it was a huge surprise. And the other one that was a really big surprise was the first release um, out of Village Roadshow Pictures Asia, uh, which we invested in, Stephen Chow's Journey to the West, which, you know, Stephen Chow is a huge star in China, but he's more known for his acting than for his directing, and this was the first movie that he was directing but not appearing in. And everybody, including Stephen, we were all really nervous about the movie, but we love him, we wanted to work with him. We thought it would make about 50 million US dollars and it ended up making over 200 million US dollars in mainland China alone. And to date is the second highest grossing movie released in China ever. So, it, so there's some really, and a lot of the surprise have to do with changing audience preferences and changing technology and changing marketing techniques and all the things that we talked about today. I think I'm getting the signal that we're about there, so I just want to say thank you to our panelists, to Ellen, Peter, Craig, John. Thank you very much. <laughs>